All right, well, thank you very much for joining us today, Phil. My pleasure. So uh, tell us about uh, what it is that you do over at NASA, especially with the Commercial Crew Program. Okay. Uh, I work at NASA headquarters in the Human Exploration and Operations Mission Directorate. And in that office, I run a division called the Commercial Spaceflight Development Division. And that manages and oversees the commercial cargo and crew program. When did you first start working uh, on this program? Well, that's a good question. It depends on what you mean by working on this program. I joined NASA about seven years ago in 2005 when Mike Griffin came over into the agency. I think even at that time, Mike knew that he wanted to do something more commercially uh, while he was at the agency. And it was, about, it was good timing for me when I was about leaving my previous company, so it sort of made sense for me to join NASA, given my experience and, and background in commercial space. So I started in 05, and at that time I was working in the Office of Program Analysis and Evaluation. So it was our job in that office to evaluate NASA programs in terms of their effectiveness and performance, and I reviewed the COTS program several times uh, during that period of about two or three or four years, and then moved over to a mission directorate, and I'm in my current position now for about two years, two and a half years, overseeing commercial crew and cargo. Um, as far as COTS is concerned, um, at what point did you guys realize that uh, Kistler Aerospace wasn't going to be able to meet some of their milestones and had to cancel their contract? Right. Um, it was relatively early in terms of the entire agreement. Uh, we understood at the time that we made the awards to Rocket Plane Kistler, which had a very good technical concept, that the biggest risk associated with their whole plan was the financing. Uh, they had some very aggressive financing goals from the private sector that they were um, needing to meet. So because of that, recognizing that that was one of their risk areas, we put some financial milestones early in their agreement process so that we wouldn't get too far down the road and realize that this thing wasn't going to work. Uh, we wanted to mitigate the government's exposure, so we put some financial milestones relatively early, sort of front-loaded them in the agreement. Those were the milestones that turned out to be the most challenging for uh, RPK. Uh, they ended up not meeting some of those milestones. We gave them a little bit of time to, to recover. And, it, and at some point fairly early, it became clear that that was just not going to happen. It was, it was a terrible time credit-wise uh, credit early in this uh, previous decade. So we, we terminated the agreement. Uh, it was within the first year of that, of that Space Act agreement. And when that happened, was Orbital Sciences a shoo-in, or did a few of the original applicants come back to try to, to get that second contract? Yeah, we made another announcement and got many proposals. Uh, so no, Orbital was not a shoo-in uh, by any stretch of the, the, the imagination, but their proposal rose to the top and ended up getting an award in the second round. So now, uh, with the CC Dev program, you guys are um, continuing with the, the Space Act agreements in the new phase, which is going to be the CC ICAP. Um, how soon can we expect um, any sort of announcements on uh, what companies will, will possibly be selected for that? So it's coming very soon, so stay tuned. Uh, we said in the announcement that we would make the awards um, in July slash August, and we are still on schedule to meeting that, so very soon we hope to be able to announce those awards. With um, uh, CC ICAP, um, is there still going to be one more phase before you down select to one or two um, companies or is it still going to be a little bit more open and try to get as many companies going on their projects as possible? So we haven't determined the entire acquisition strategy for, uh, for the entire development phase, uh, but right now the CCI cap awards, um, what we have requested in terms of proposals from industry is to give us a base period uh, that would be about 21 months in duration and would end in about a, what we call a critical design review level of maturity. It, mean, it, it pretty much means that you've made all your major design decisions and you're ready for full-scale production, integration, and test. Uh, so that's the first part, uh, the base period of the ICAP awards. But then we said we'd like you to go all the way out to a first crewed flight. So we will see development within the Space Act Agreement under a base period and optional milestones that go all the way out to crewed flight. Now, before we actually go and do ISS services, we have to certify those vehicles as safe for uh, NASA astronauts, as um, meeting our human rating requirements, and we're definitely going to need a far base procurement. We cannot do that under a Space Act agreement, we don't, we don't believe. So we're definitely going to have another set of awards, maybe two, 
uh, to do the certification of those vehicles. We haven't um, established definitively how we're going to do that yet, but it will be under some sort of uh, more traditional contract mechanism. Hypothetically speaking, if um only one or two of the companies were uh, contracted with the FAR contracting, but if another company were to continue their development and were able to have a fully functional capsule, or capsule, excuse me, and if they were to get certified through the FAA, could NASA still purchase tickets through them, or would we still need to go through the entire rating process? I think before NASA would purchase services, we would want to certify those for our mission. Um, so it's it's we still have some work in front of us to figure out exactly who has responsibility for what between us and the FAA. We've recently signed a memorandum of understanding uh, with the FAA to sort of um, lay out some of the policy groundwork associated with that. So that's a really good positive step, I believe. Um, but yes, I I think if NASA it, downstream in the near term, if we're going to purchase services, we are going to want to certify those vehicles according to our requirements. Um, however, you bring up a good point that if a company is not selected in CCI cap, that doesn't preclude them from doing their own development and coming in later. Uh, a lot of people have used the term down select, and technically, in terms of procurement uh, regulations, that's not what we're doing. Uh, within you know, CCDF2, we have four funded uh, partners and three unfunded partners. We are not down selecting from those. We're letting anybody propose, and we're going to select from those proposals. We do believe it'll be fewer in number, um, but it's not a down select from a previously existing group. So that's an important consideration. And I believe that will also be the case for the FAR based contracts, for the certification contracts, and certainly for the ISS services phase. We expect those to be full and open competitions. So if somebody wants to come back in, even if, even if not winning one of their previous rounds, I think NASA is going to be open to that, and we welcome that. And as you saw for a lot of people that were in the luncheon speaker today, uh, that was Mark Sarangelo, and he has been unsuccessful a couple times uh, with his dream, cha dream Chaser concept and is still plugging away and, uh, and was successful in CCDF2 after um, not being successful on COTS Cargo. So we would definitely like to be able to um, support that in the future and let somebody else come in who wasn't in one of the previous rounds.